Hello and welcome to part three of my flight preparation series. The purpose of this series is not to teach you how to prepare for a flight. That's the job of a flying instructor. I'm here merely to show you how I do it. Coming up in this episode. We'll choose the frequencies for our trip, calculate our weight and balance, estimate the fuel required and work out how much runway we'll need for takeoff and landing. So in the previous episode you saw that I plotted a route from Biggin Hill to Sherburn in Elmet. Now who I talk to on the radio during this journey will depend on a few factors. First of all of course, who do I have to talk to by law? Biggin Hill Aerodrome is a controlled aerodrome in that it has full ATC. It's in Class G airspace, so I will have to talk to them to get taxi and takeoff clearance. Uh, once I leave them, the next station I will have to talk to is going to be Luton, and their frequency will be on the chart here. I'll need their permission to transit their controlled airspace. I'll probably want to talk to Cranfield as I approach and pass over their overhead, even though I'm probably unlikely to want to go through their ATZ, that's because they have a lot of instrument uh, approaches in that area and I don't want to get tangled up with them, they will want to know about me. I probably won't have to talk to Northampton Sywell as I go overhead, I might want to of course, um, because I'll probably be over 2,500 feet. And so as I'm not passing through their ATZ, I don't have to talk to them. The same is true for Leicester here, but I will need to talk to East Midlands to get clearance to pass through their controlled airspace. And then coming further north, there's more controlled airspace here, but there's a very good chance that I'll be underneath it. And so I won't need to talk to them to get clearance through it. And finally, I want to talk to Sherburn in Almet to get a mental picture of what's going on in the aerodrome, uh, to announce my intentions to other traffic in the area and to get the latest uh, aerodrome information. All of the frequencies that you need can be found in the AIP. Most of the frequencies that you're going to want to talk to will actually be printed on the CAA charts. And you can also download frequency reference cards from the NATS website. Next. Who do we talk to in the bits of airspace in between those stations that we have to talk to? Well, first of all, you might want to ask yourself, do I really want to or do I need to talk to anyone? If the answer is no, then why bother? Um, if you do want to talk to someone, then I would be suggesting that you try and get a service from a lower airspace radar unit. There are a number around the UK. The coverage is a little bit patchy in some areas, but most of the UK is covered. And if you're flying VFR, you can get a traffic service or a basic service from a lower airspace radar unit. Uh, if you're IFR, you can get both of those services, but you can also get deconfliction uh, service as well. Um, if you didn't want to talk to someone but you were perhaps transiting near to controlled airspace, you may find that that area has a listening squawk. And this is a relatively new thing where you can select a transponder code on your transponder, tune into the selective frequency, and then everyone knows that you're listening to that frequency. Details of the lower airspace radar services, their frequencies, range and hours of operation are in the en route section of the UK AIP. If you aren't bothered about getting a radar service, you could talk to London or Scottish information. From either of those, you will get a basic service. Now that we've addressed frequencies, let's take a look at our weight and balance. Every individual aircraft will have its own weight and balance schedule. This is the one for Golf Bravo Hotel Oscar Romeo, my PA28, and it shows the maximum authorised weight of the aircraft, it shows the basic empty weight of the aircraft, that's the weight of the aircraft minus the usable fuel and any luggage, and then it shows the centre of gravity for the plane, and over the page it shows you all the different lever arms. Um, this, is, this is the number that you will need to use to calculate how the effect of weight in that particular part of the aircraft, be it the fuel tanks, the baggage compartment at the, at the rear, the effect of the weight on the balance of the aircraft uh, in those individual compartments of the aeroplane. 
I have these figures programmed into Sky Demon, and our group has a spreadsheet too, which is very helpful. I type in the weight of the passengers, bags and fuel, and I can see whether I'm within the safe weight and balance envelope or not. You can obviously calculate this manually as well. Next, let's have a look at how much fuel we'll need. And that will depend on the weather conditions on the day. Now if I were flying this flight today, my calculations tell me that it would take me roughly two hours. To divert to Humberside Aerodrome, it will take me another 18 minutes. I'm going to write down 20 minutes here. By law, I should have a reserve. For VFR flight, it's 30 minutes. For IFR flights, it's 45 minutes. I usually uh, allow for 45 minutes regardless of my flight rules. So we add all of those times up and we come up with a figure of 185 minutes, uh, three hours and five minutes. To work out how much fuel you need will depend on how much fuel your aircraft burns. In the case of Oscar Romeo, it's anything up to 35 litres of Avgas per hour. So calculating that, I come out with 108 litres. On top of that, I add another contingency of 5%. Just in case the wind isn't quite right, maybe I have to take a longer route around somewhere, I add another 5%. So my total fuel required for this journey is 114 litres. Now, if the weather's great, cav OK, no problems, then I could fly with 114 litres. If the weather's a little bit marginal, or perhaps I'm worried about a front coming in or something like that, I take more fuel. The more fuel I have, the longer, of course, I can stay in the air or divert to a, an aerodrome much further away if I have to. Next, let's tackle aircraft performance. This is all about how much runway you will need for takeoff and landing. And that will depend largely on the weather. What's the temperature outside? What's the air pressure? The wind strength and direction. Then it's how much do you weigh? What's the runway surface? Is it hard or is it soft? Is there a slope? And is the runway surface contaminated with snow, ice or water? So I start this process by writing down the relevant data. We start with the temperature. I look at the highest forecast temperature for the aerodromes that I'm flying to or taking off from. So let's say that the temperature today is 10 Celsius. Next, it's the Q&H, the uh, air pressure outside. I'm looking for the lowest pressure. What I'm doing here is finding the highest temperature and the lowest pressure for my route. That will give me the worst case scenario, the worst performance that I can expect today. So let's say that the q &H is 1,003 millibars. Now from that pressure, I can work out what the pressure altitude is. And I'm going to need the pressure altitude to work out my takeoff distances. This is because the way our aeroplane performs in the air depends on how dense the air is. That changes depending on the temperature and air pressure. To know how much runway we need for takeoff and landing, we have to factor in today's conditions. Today's pressure at sea level is 1,003 hectopascals. Our altimeter will read zero at sea level. If our aerodrome is at 600 feet, which is the case at Biggin Hill, our altimeter will read 600 feet when we're on the runway if we have Q&H 1003 set. As we climb up into the sky, the pressure falls. For every 30 feet, it drops one hectopascal. So what is pressure altitude and how do we calculate it? Pressure altitude is the altitude in the international standard atmosphere. The standard pressure is 1,013 hectopascals. The pressure altitude is the altitude our altimeter will read if we set 1013 on the subscale. So if the Q&H is 1,003, that's 10 hectopascals lower than the standard pressure of 1,013. And as one hectopascal is equivalent to 30 feet, our pressure altitude at sea level will be 300 feet and at our aerodrome, it will be 900 feet. Once we've worked out the pressure altitude and the temperature, we can turn to the graphs specific for your particular aircraft. As I say, every aircraft is different, so make sure you're using the right charts for your aircraft. Now, these charts look quite complicated, but they're actually fairly easy to follow. You start at the left, 
and you begin with the outside air temperature. We said that the temperature today would uh, reach 10 Celsius, so we start at 10. We follow the line all the way up to the pressure altitude, and we agreed, didn't we, that the takeoff pressure altitude at Biggin Hill was going to be 900 feet. So once we've reached 900 feet, we can then follow the line across to the reference line here. Now we follow this curved line down to our actual takeoff weight, which we agreed earlier was 2,086 pounds, which is about here. Then we follow the line across to the reference line for nil wind, and I usually calculate my takeoff distances assuming no wind. Unless it's going to be a very, very tight takeoff, I factor in no wind at all. That way I really am working with the worst case scenario on the day. And it's showing here that my takeoff distance is 1,250 feet. That's without any flaps. If I wanted to reduce that distance, I could use some flaps. In the UK, we use meters for our takeoff distances. So I have to do a little calculation here to convert that to meters. And it's 382 meters. Now I add to that a number of safety factors. There's a safety factor that the CAA recommends you use for all your takeoff distances of 1.33. So I multiply that figure by 1.33. That gives me a takeoff distance of 507 meters. If there was an upslope, I'd have to allow for that. If the runway was wet, I'd have to allow for that. So that's how you work out your takeoff distances. There are similar methods for calculating your landing distances too. That's all for now. We're nearly set for our flight. In our next episode, I'll look at the NOTAMs, airspace restrictions, and we'll study the airfield charts. Music